If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn in them with me to Matthew chapter 7, the New Testament book of Matthew, where we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6 of Matthew chapter 7. It's great to be with you. It's always a privilege to be able to preach God's Word, especially on Veterans Day, where we are reminded that we're able to be here without the fear of armed um, guards of some sort coming in and disrupting our worship. And so it's, especially on a day like today, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very enjoyable. Thank, we thank the Lord for um, the freedoms that we have in this land, which are the result of so many. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 of what we're looking at this morning. And my title for the sermon is, How to Understand the Command of Jesus to judge not. A number of years ago a survey was done and the question before the people was what is the um, best known verse in the Bible? And this, this was one of those man on the street sort of surveys. Um, so it was not just Christians or folks in churches who were asked this question, but it was just your, your random American walking around on the street. What's the best known verse in the Bible, and of most of us, if you if you were to fill that out and you know the the survey or be asked that question, most of you would say, well, the best known verse in the Bible is John chapter three verse sixteen, and you'd quote, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life." Maybe you have the images of the guy back in the seventies or eighties that had the rainbow hair or whatever, and in the end zones at the Super Bowl and that kind of stuff, and so that's what most people. Uh, think of when they think of the best known verse in the Bible. But surprisingly, this survey showed us that there's a new number one. And people didn't really know the verse, the whole verse, and they didn't even know the location, the address. They actually only knew two words, and they're the words judge not. Or in some translations, it's do not judge. But you get the concept. That's the, that's the new number one, best known, most well-known, most uh, appreciated or whatever Bible verse that just your man on the street knows today. It's sometimes been referred to as the 11th commandment. Now, probably most of us are not really surprised at that. It's, it's become really a part of our culture to, to say that sort of stuff. We, we say things, well, I'm not judging here, or, or this is a no judgment zone, or um, there, I'm not judging, by, there's, there's no judgment here. It's, it's really the great sin of our day in the eyes of, of many in the world. Um, it's the one thing you can't do. You can do a lot of things, but the one thing you can't do is, is say, be critical of something or, or, to, or to be judgmental or something like that. And so that's what I want to look at this morning. Um, this is just a, a, a passage of Scripture. You know, most um, preachers are going to have, going to be preaching through books of the Bible. And so this is one that is just a standalone sermon that, um, uh, that can hopefully be helpful for us wherever God has you in your life these days. So if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's holy word from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Reading from the ESV, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how, you, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is God's Word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our Lord, many times when there is a guest preacher, the congregation spends more time sizing up the man than hearing the message. And I pray that this morning you allow the folks here of Third Presbyterian Church to quickly get beyond trying to figure out who the new guy is up there and instead open eyes and hearts to behold wonderful things from this your law. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I 
<clears throat> it's probably an overused illustration, but it works well for what I want to say today as I try to expound upon Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 7. It's, it's that of a flight attendant. Now, my oldest daughter is a flight attendant, and so she, she could uh, say it verbatim, I'm sure, because the FAA requires flight attendants on every flight to go through the safety instructions. And you're familiar with that. They tell you where the exits are and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, they tell you about how um, in, the, in the case, the unlikely event of a loss of cabin pressure or something like that, then there's going to drop down out of this compartment above your head this oxygen mask. And the one thing that they're very diligent to say is be very diligent to take care of your own mask first. Get that secure, and then you can help those who are around you. Well, there's a spiritual principle there that I believe we see in this passage of Scripture. And that is, it's our natural tendency to focus on the sin of others. But Jesus is telling us here, deal with your own sin first. Keep your eyes on your own issues. Deal with your own matters. Again, to, to see others' sin is, is what comes natural to us. That's one of my points here. But to point the fingers at others, to be the critic, to be the negative, fussy, um, criticizing, gossiping, slandering. Jesus is saying, listen, deal with your own sins first. That's where you've got to keep the priority. That's what you've got to focus on. And then you can work with others. We are called as Christians. You are called. I am called. We are called as Christians to deal with our own sin first. So let me try to unpack it with three points. Number one, dealing with our own sin first is not natural. Dealing with our own sin first is not natural. It's natural to focus on the sins of others. And we know this because of verse 1, which tells us to judge not or do not judge, that you be not judged. And also because of verse 5, where we're told first take the speck out of, uh, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you can remove the speck that's in your brother's eye. What's interesting, I think we forget this very simple observation here. We've got to be told this. Jesus has to command us to deal with your own sins first. You know, if we were loving, if we were generous, if we were gracious and patient and merciful, we wouldn't have to be told not to focus on the sins of others. But Jesus here tells us not to focus on the sins of others. He tells us to avoid the critical spirit, to avoid being so pessimistic and negative and critical, to, to, to get rid of this condemning um, posture that we have as we look at the world. Just last Saturday, I was doing some yard work, and um, the, the boy across the street from us, it's, he's really a delight because as we all have experienced have seen or maybe we've experienced with our own kids, uh, so many kids today spend time on their devices and they've got a screen in front of them most of the time. And I really enjoy watching this boy across the street because he's always out there playing football, playing baseball, throwing the, the tennis ball up against the, the side of the house and bouncing it to him and he's probably going to be a good baseball player someday. And, um, and so he's always out there, they're playing kickball, and they get some of the neighbor kids, and they're riding scooters. This kind of stuff is always going on. It's really a delight to see. But the other thing that I regularly see is them fighting. <laughs> it's, it's the old, um, uh, that was foul. No, it wasn't. Um, I got you. No, you didn't. It missed me. And, you know, they're just fighting. They're arguing. They spend more time arguing about the rules and things like that than they actually do playing the game, it seems like, sometimes. And, of course, uh, in this particular one case, ha what happens is what often happens. And the, the boy who actually lived there at one point was fed up, and he went in. He was done with everybody. He picked up his toys and went home, in a sense. And, of course, came, came back out about ten minutes later with his head hanging and tried to enter into the game again. But, you know, that's what we do, isn't it? As people, we're always finding faults in others. We're always in the midst of conflict we're always um, arguing and debating and, and going at each other. That's, that's our natural tendency because we're sinners. We're always being, needing to be reminded, don't focus on the sins of others. Don't, don't be so critical. Don't be so pessimic, pessimistic and negative. Dealing with, with our own sins first is just not natural. What's natural is not e being able to get along. What's natural is to always be running somebody off, to have a difficult situation. It's just not natural to focus 
uh, on our own sins. Instead, what's natural is for us to focus on the sins of others. At our, our church where I pastor in Fairhope, um, uh, not too long ago, a member left our church. Members do that sometimes, and it's always uh, a, a, a very difficult time for a pastor, for, for, for folks who, who know folks, and, and for them to, to leave for whatever reason. You know, um, people have all kinds of different reasons why they leave uh, churches. And um, this guy, particular guy, was frustrated because he wasn't receiving a bunch of phone calls from, uh, from pastors, staff, elders, deacons, friends, or whatever. Um, after a couple, of few weeks of him being gone, you know, trying to find out what's going on, where he was, why he had left, and things like that. And so I got word back that he was mad at at me, mad at us because we had not done a good job reaching out to him. And I don't doubt at all that we that we did a poor job of reaching out to him. But I do wonder if the thought ever crossed his mind that. Maybe the lack of a call says more about him and his situation than it does about the fellow church members who didn't do a good job of calling him. You know, maybe it indicates that he wasn't well connected in relationships. Maybe it connected that he didn't have friends. But apparently his frustration was focused on others. His, his frustration was outward. And it's just not natural to say, what's wrong with me? What have what I done to contri contribute to the problems in this situation? What's natural is to focus on others and their sins. Now you see here a couple of ways that we sort of deal with other people and versus ourselves. It's natural for us to have differing standards, to have a, a set of standards for others that we can that we can meet, but others can't. You look at verse two. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. One commentary said this. The error of the judgmental person here is not in the diagnosis. And I mean, indeed, the guy has a speck in his eye. So the error is not in the diagnosis. But, in, but the error is in the failure to apply to himself the standard. The criticism he so meticulously applies to his brother. That's the failure. To apply that to ourselves. You know, we're, we're all really good at being strict with others, but then giving ourselves a lot of leniency, a lot of room for, for error, a lot of, a lot of opportunity we're, um, to, for, for growth, but, but with others, we're very strict. Francis Schaeffer once said, God would need to do nothing more to condemn us all a thousand times over than simply to hang a recorder around our necks and then hold us to the same standard according to which we had condemned others. It's very natural for us to have these differing standards. And then another thing that we see here that's natural for us as we look at others to sin, others' uh, issues in their lives is to jump to conclusions. We're, we're, we're really good at coming to conclusions about people. Uh, verse 5 says, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And this, this verse here teaches that, that, that we're way too quick in coming to conclusions about people. This is a true story of a lady who um, wanted to visit a certain church in town. It wasn't Birmingham. It's not in any of your churches here locally, but it is a true story. And um, in this particular situation, a church had gotten a new pastor and the lady wanted to go and, and hear this particular preacher. She'd heard some good things about him, and so she wanted to go hear him. She didn't really have a, a, a church home that she went to, attended regularly, and um, she, um, she also had the opinion that this particular church was kind of a snooty church in town. That's where all the, all the wealthy people went who were stuck up and things like that, so she had this, she was being judgmental towards them, and so she, um, uh, so she, she wanted to go, and she, was, she knew one lady in the church, not good friends, but an acquaintance. She was hoping that she would see this particular lady in church on this Sunday so that she could maybe sit with her and she'd have somebody that she knew. She goes to church, doesn't see the lady that she knows, the friend, and uh, she got there a little bit late and it was crowded, so she sat in the balcony. The service was, was fine, the, the sermon was good, everything was, went well. And um, as she's coming down the stairs into the narthex, the lobby area of the church, she saw the lady that she knew who had been sitting on the, the, the floor section of the, the sanctuary coming up 
And she realized, oh, good, we're going we're gonna to kind of meet in the narthex about the same time. I'm going to get to the bottom of the stairs about the time that she arrives. And so she was looking forward to being able to greet her and say hi. And um, right, as, right when they were getting close to the point where they'd be able to, to see each other and talk, um, the, the church member lady who had not seen the visitor lady to that point looked up and saw her and also right after that, I mean, literally stuck her nose up in the air and went darting off to the side. And so the visitor lady was quite frustrated and spent the next two weeks telling all her friends that indeed this was the snooty church. Um, they, they didn't talk to you. They weren't friendly. They were very much stuck up and things like that. And, and so she was running everybody into the ground. And then she went to the grocery store. And she turned the corner in the grocery store and nearly ran into this church member lady. And being good southerners, of course, they played nice and talked about, you know, good things and how we were nice, you know, very nice to each other and so forth. And then eventually the church member lady said to her, oh, by the way, I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to speak with you uh, the other week when, you, when I saw you at church there. But right when I got into the lobby, I got a nosebleed and I had to go off to the side and get the <laughs> tissue to take care of this matter. Of course, the the, the visitor lady then, you know, properly felt really small that she had been running this church into the ground and this lady, when all she had done was jump to conclusions, negative conclusions. She wasn't charitable in her judgments about this lady or this church. That's what we do, isn't it? We set up different standards for ourselves. We jump to conclusions about people. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. We're called to love. We're, we're called not to be harsh or to be always pointing out others' faults, to be focused on them. We're, we should give people the benefit of the doubt. Giving people the benefit of the doubt. I remember one time where a church member was uh, accused of, of, of a very heinous sin. And, an, and another, a man who was another church member was there as a part of the conversation. He was a deacon, actually. And so there was... There was conversation about how, how can we help this guy? What we, can we do in this situation? A very serious sin. And, um, and so the, this deacon there, there, the fellow church member who was a part of the conversation when, when it was stated what this man had been accused of, this, this deacon said, him? No way. He wouldn't do that. I know him. He's a godly man. He loves his wife. He loves his, loves his children. He wouldn't do that. That's not him. I don't believe it. You know, don't you want that for yourself? If someone were to accuse you of some gross sin, something serious, don't you want somebody to say that about you? And it's not a call to be gullible, not at all, but I want my first reaction to be, no, he wouldn't do that. She wouldn't do that. That's not him. That's not her. You want to have charitable judgments towards others, being gracious with people, loving. Judge not, Jesus says here. Do not judge. Don't be critical. Let don't uh, what people think oftentimes though when I say about uh, think about this what oftentimes we think is that Jesus is saying when he says judge not it, it means don't be critical just let people do whatever they want that's not the point of Jesus words here we are to help with with people with their sin and that's the second point here but but we are to judge ourselves first we're to keep our eyes on our own sins first and dealing with our own issues first dealing with our own sin is not natural. Second, dealing with our own sin first is not comprehensive, meaning that's not all we're called to do. Dealing with our own sin is not all we're called to do. When it comes to dealing with sin, there's more to it than just dealing with our own sin. It's a part of our calling with others to help them with their struggles, their issues, their sin. Verse 5 is clear. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So we're called to deal with our own sin first, yes, but it doesn't mean we can't um, get ourselves involved in relationships in a deep way where we're helping people work through matters and deal with sin in their lives. Matter of fact, this is telling us that we are expected to do that. It's loving to help people with sin in their lives. Now John Stott says, I, did, I, don't, I didn't know this, I haven't read this personally, but John Stott says, uh, that Leo Tolstoy, the Russian novelist uh, Tolstoy, took the view that Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 7 forbade the institution of any human court of law. Verse 5 here requires judging. 
We are commanded to be involved in the lives of others. If we're going to help others with their issues, this means we've got to be entangled in a web of relationships. There's got to be depth and friendship and, and trust and time together. This summer I was able to baptize my granddaughter, um, Liv. Um, Reagan and Ross are members at Cahaba Park PCA here in Birmingham. And so I was able to come up for the baptism. And one of the things that I said before I put the water on Liv's head was I reminded the people there, the congregation, and you're familiar with this. When you baptize a baby, there's always a vow for you, the congregation. And you are, it, the, the, the question is asked, do you as uh, the, fellow, the members of this congregation promise to assist the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? And so what I said was, I don't know if you realize what you just said yes to. This, that's a big deal. Uh, what you just said yes to is being involved in relationships. You just said yes to helping with the nursery. You just said yes to helping with Sunday school. You just said yes to disciplining a child or, or correcting a child when, when, they're, uh, when they're misbehaving in some way. You just said yes to, um, to calling a parent when you hear a rumor about their teenage child or something like that. that this is a big deal. This is what we're called to do as Christians to be involved in others, to not let this idea of dealing with our own sin first, which is the theme of my sermon, not letting it be comprehensive. We are called to be connected to other people. And the easiest way really to avoid criticism and being critical of others and to be criticized ourselves is really just to avoid people, to stay away from them. And so I charged the congregation that day when I baptized Liv, listen, your, your calling is to be involved in a deep way in, in their lives dealing with our own sin. It's not natural. It's also not comprehensive. We're commanded to be involved in the lives of others. And then finally, number three, dealing with our own sin first is not possible. It's not natural. It's not comprehensive. It's not possible. And I'll just add the caveat there without the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ in our behalf. Verse, verse five tells us here that we don't see well that we have an eyesight issue. We don't see the planks in our own eyes. And verse 5 tells us that dealing with sin is not possible without the, ha the help of some outside source or outside agency. In other words, it takes someone other than yourself to help you get rid of the sin, uh, the sin in your life. I wear a, just a single contact lens, um, a, a reader. I used to have... With, um, readers and I was just taking them on and off all the time when I'd preach sermon and I, driving me and I, everybody else I guess crazy and so an ophthalmologist in our church said listen you need to get one of these things just a just a single contact that's a reader in your eye and um, and your your brain will adjust and so as I'm looking at things up close here I'm this it's working through the contact and then I look out there it's working through this other eye it's really great the, the way God made the body and and made these things work. And so um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And so I, not too long ago, changed contacts. And um, going to bed at night, I could not get the new one out. And hadn't had any trouble with it for over a year uh, with this kind of, not the sing, not that one contact. I wasn't using that one for a year. But um, I've been taking them in and out every night. And, um, and this particular night with the new contact, I couldn't get it out. And they're the kind that you can sleep in, so uh, I thought, well, I'll just, you know, we'll see if it's any better in the morning. Probably not the wisest thing in the world, but let's see if it's any better in the morning. So morning, get up, and still I cannot get that thing out. Finally, I just thought, well, maybe if I take some of that contact solution stuff and squirt it in my eye real hard, you know, maybe, maybe that'll help. And again, I don't, you know, doctor might say not a good idea, Michael, but it worked. It took, some, it took something from outside of myself. I couldn't get rid of that. I couldn't get it off my eye. My eye. But when I get some, got something, an outside source, an outside um, agency of some sort, it, I was able to get it out. No trouble. That's the way it is with our own sin. You know, some of you are here today and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I need to, that's right, this was a good sermon, a, a good point. I need to quit being so critical. I need to... Uh, quit being so focused on others' sins. Maybe you're even saying to yourself, yeah, you know, I, I do. I need to turn over a new leaf. I, I, need, I need to do better. Stop it. Don't, don't think that way. Turning over a leaf, it's, it's not possible. Your only hope 
is the leaf, the coverings of Christ. He's the only one that can, that can fi fix us. We, we can't fix ourselves. We can't fix our own lives. Our only hope is Jesus. And God's holy wrath, it, it should rightfully fall on all of us for being so critical, for being so negative, for so being, being fixated on the sins of others, for, for having different standards, higher standards for them that we have for ourselves, for jumping to conclusions. God's holy wrath rightly should fall on us for those things. His holy wrath should rightly fall on us for being afraid of people and not entering into deep relationships where you do help each other work through issues. Or maybe our sin of being too busy that we get involved in others' lives for being cowardly not to confront sin or have hard conversations. God's wrath should fall on us for all of those things. God's holy wrath should fall on us for our sin of thinking that we can take care of our problems by ourselves. For thinking that we have the ability to turn over a new leaf, to change. But the holy, rightful wrath of God fell on Jesus who took the punishment that you deserve and that I deserve. He, that sixth verse there that seems out of place about not giving dogs what is sacred or throwing your pearls to swine, the pearls before pigs, it seems out of place to it. But when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, that's what we mean. The Holy One of God, who was perfect and righteous in every way, He was the one that was thrown to the dogs. He was the one who was trampled underfoot. He was the one who was attacked. I should have been. You should have been. We should be the ones thrown to the dogs, trampled underfoot, accused, attacked. But Jesus did. God demonstrates his own love towards you and me that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet critical, while we were yet cowardly to enter into relationships, while we were yet jumping to conclusions about people, Christ died for those sins. And he lived a perfectly righteous life that is the only possibility to ever stand before God in a, right, in, in a right way. And when we remember His mercy toward us, when we think about Him forgiving us of our sins, that's when we are enabled to make a little bit of progress in loving others and being merciful and generous and charitable and less fussy and critical. When we remember the gracious treatment we've received from the Lord, that makes us gracious with others. I want to close with a somewhat long story. I do have my clock up here, you know, so I will keep my eye on this. But I want to tell you about a lady named Amy and her relationship with Christ and Faith Presbyterian Church in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and particularly some deacons who had come to know the love of God and the mercy of God. She was a mercy ministry request at that particular church in uh, January of 2000. And a mercy minutes request means she had come to the church looking for some money. And in January of 2004, Faith Presbyterian Church in Tacoma, Washington received a letter from Minnesota. And this was the letter. Dear Faith Presbyterian Church, my name is Amy Harton. I came to your church for financial assistance about four years ago. At the time, I was a member of the Baha'i Faith and had been sober for only about nine months. I came to meet with the deacons and I made it quite clear I had no intention or even interest in becoming a Christian. I thought that because of this they would sure, surely turn me down and turn me away, but that is, the, that is most certainly not what happened. They agreed to pay my rent in full. I was amazed and thought surely this was the greatest gift from God. The Lord had worked through them and allowed me to stay in my house. However, four years later I realized that that alone was not the greatest gift I received that night. Before I left them, they gave me a Bible, a Bible that stayed on the shelf for three years. When I picked that book up after so long, I read what they had written in the cover and then started to read the rest. I have to tell you that from that moment, I picked it up. After three years, my life began to change. I now read my Bible daily. I want you to know that your generosity and love has guided me to a place in my life and a relationship with God I, that I never could have imagined. I have found a, a wonderful church here in Minnesota and have had the wonderful opportunity to help out in Sunday school. And I will be baptized on February 15, 2004. I was asked to share my story of conversion with the congregation a couple of weeks ago and am including that with this letter. 
I wanted to share it with you as your church has been so instrumental in this transformation. Again, I want to thank you for sharing God's grace with me. God bless you. Much love and gratitude, Amy Hart. And P.S., you might also be interested to know that I've now been sober for just under five years. That's exciting. I mean, that's wonderful. But as she said, she sent a letter along with that. And it, the letter really was uh, the testimony that she read to St. John's Lutheran Church in Minnesota on February 1st, 2004. And this was her testimony that she shared with the church that day. I was raised in a very uh, religious family, though it was not Christian. About four years ago, I was going through a very difficult and low time in my life. During that time, I lost my job and as a result, could not pay my rent. I called United Way and they gave me many phone numbers of places to call. I called all but one and none of them could help. At this point, I went to a relative to ask if I could stay with their family and they turned me down. I had no other choice but to call this one last place. This place was a church, Faith Presbyterian Church. I called and made an appointment to meet with the deacons. I must tell you, I was terrified. <laughs> so if you're a deacon, you're thinking, well, we're not that scary. <laughs> I knew what they would say, and I knew that they would not help, but I had no other option but to try, so I went. On the way there, I prayed and prayed and prayed that God would uh, be there and with me and hold my hand. I was terrified because my understanding of Christians was that they thought anyone who didn't believe in a God the way they did was surely going to end up in hell, and why would this church want to help someone like that? They wouldn't. I wanted so bad for them just to love me and not be judgmental. Well, I got there and sat in this room talking to the deacons, and sure enough, the Bible and Jesus came up. They asked what I believed, and I told them, uh, and they quoted the Bible, saying that no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. And, of course, I got defensive. They told me that they were not there to argue with me, but that this was their job, and they wouldn't be doing their job if they didn't tell me this, if they didn't try to give me this good news. That calmed me down a great deal. Somehow I understood this, and I knew God was sitting right there beside me, uh, helping me through this meeting. So we got done talking, and I was asked to leave so they could talk among themselves. I left the room and knew they would, uh, that they would say they couldn't help either. They wouldn't help either. I went back into the room when they were ready for me, and still I knew, but they floored me by saying that they had decided to pay my rent for me. I could not believe it. I had made it perfectly clear to them that I was in no way interested in converting to their belief, but they were willing to help. They were willing to help a non-Christian. I was literally stunned. As they were wrapping up, they gave me a Bible. I went home in the Bible and put the Bible somewhere where it was not touched for some years later. Over the next few years, especially this past year, I started questioning the faith I had grown up in. During this time, I moved here to Minnesota and got very close to a Christian woman whom I developed an incredible amount of respect for and most of all trust in. I had finally found a person I could voice my fears and questions to, and so I did. This led me finally, after three years, to pick up that Bible that the church had given me. As I opened it, I saw that they had written in the cover, Amy, please read John chapter 3, page 921, and John 14, verse 6, page 936. Then keep going. May you know the joy of sin forgiven by the Lord Jesus. I tell you, I did just that. I read what they had suggested and then continued to read. I couldn't put it down. It seemed like the best book I had ever read. Today, even though it's taken four years, the love shown by that church in Washington has led me to the belief that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He died on the cross for me, and not only for me, but for all of us. I am truly forgiven and truly loved by God. He has come into my heart and made me whole. When the, when the letter arrived there to, to the church in Tacoma, Washington, um, they checked their files, and sure enough, they had notes. Amy Harton came to the church Wednesday, January 12, 2000. Their files read, she is needing help to pay her rent that was past due. She spoke with Doug Bond, Phil German, and Ken Cavell. A check for $360 was sent to her landlord the next day. And the notes there in uh, her file they record her history of alcoholism, which she had honestly admitted to the deacons. It noted that uh, her family lived in Minnesota, that she had studied at a uh, local college there, and that she had an interview the following day for a job as a baker. Faith Tacoma Church faxed a letter. Remember, this is 2004. <laughs> they faxed a letter to the church in Minnesota to tell Amy that the Congregation of Faith Presbyterian Church would be thinking about her and praying for her on the day of her baptism. And they also sent a gift Elizabeth Elliot's biography by Amy Carmichael, inscribed by the three deacons who had met her four years earlier. You know, the, the deacons there, they had met the mercy of God. They had received forgiveness of sins. They knew the love of God. And so they turned their eyes off of the sins of others and, made them, and it made them loving towards others instead. They had received mercy from the Lord 
and they passed it along to one who needed mercy. The pastor of faith there said, Nothing so communicates the substance of our message of God's love and grace shown forth in the person and work of Jesus than that we Christians should demonstrate in our treatment of others how much God's mercy and love have overtaken our hearts. So how can we be so fussy? How can we be so difficult and critical of others when you and I, when we've received grace and mercy without measure? How can we not involve our lives in others when God himself has come to involve himself in us? Praise the Lord for his mercy. Praise the Lord for Jesus. Let us pray. God in heaven, we do ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, enable us to rest anew in the unfathomable, rich, glorious truth of forgiveness of sins, mercy, grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, may it lead us into being more gracious, more merciful towards others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.